this meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Overview and Scrutiny Committee here on the Tuesday the 7th of May 2024. Item one is membership and terms of reference and we will notice that we have a change on our list. The first, the change is that Caroline Ball is replacing Les Bowman as one of the Labour Party representatives. Also to say this is my first meeting back here after a gap of eight years, no more than that, 27, seven years. Back, um, I was on this committee 2013 to 2017. <coughs> I have chaired the Health and Wellbeing Board at a brief period in between then. So, item two on the agenda is apologies for absence. I have got them from Councillor Seymour, Councillor Humphrey and Councillor Chicken. Do we have any further? No, everyone appears to be here. Um, item three is minutes. Minutes of the meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Overview and Scrutiny Committee held on the 2nd of April 2024 as circulated to be confirmed as a true record and signed by the Chair. I wasn't here, so can I have a proposer? Is that proposed by Councillor Hardy, seconded by Councillor Hunter? Thank you very much. Um, item four, disclosure of members' interests. Do we have any interest to declare? Uh, Councillor Hunter. Just for Norton, it's not this committee, but on page 44, which is the Cabinet Decisions, it's a loan to Branksome Parish Council and the clerk there. I know it doesn't affect us, but it's just to be open and transparent. Thank you very much, Councillor Hunter. I go to the next item on the agenda, which is the first substantive bit of our agenda, well, it's, um, primary care applications working group. Um, this is to note the monitoring report of the group and to green membership. Um, so I've got myself, uh, Councillor Nisbet, who's going to chair that, Councillor Hunter, and I also believe Councillor Richardson is going to join that. Are we all agreed with that? So I can have a proposer and a seconder for that, please. Proposed by Councillor Hunter, seconded by Councillor Hardy. That's all agreed, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, item, uh, where are we up to? Item six, Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, to note the minutes of the Health and Wellbeing Board held on the 14th of March. Do we note them? Yes, thank you. And I go on to item seven, uh, community water fluoridisation, and to receive a verbal update from the Director of Public Health on the community water fluoridation scheme in the North East. Uh, so I pass over to Jill O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who uh, don't know me, I am Jill O'Neill, Executive Director of Public Health, Stronger Communities and Inequalities. And this is um, a verbal update for yourselves because you have discussed in depth over the years our approach to good oral health for our population. You've also seen and supported our oral health strategy for the county for which the expansion of our existing community water fluoridation scheme is a component part. All other oral health promoting interventions are being developed and delivered within our strategy and we know community water fluoridation will make the biggest difference to tackling inequalities for our most deprived communities. The consultation that I want to alert you to and to direct you to, and there will be a link shared with you after this uh, meeting, is actually being led by the Department for Health and Social Care under the jurisdiction of the Secretary of State. But what I do want to highlight to you is just a brief history for those who might not be so familiar of how we've got to this point. So back in 2017, there was a huge amount of work undertaken, led by Durham and Northumberland, to explore the feasibility of expanding existing community water fluoridation programmes, working very closely with Northumbria Water and indeed all of our professional colleagues and partners, such as the dental community and paediatric community, as well as very much so our academic um, institutes as well, to look at the most up-to-date and absolutely rat ratified um, academic pieces of work. So during that period of time, 2017 to 2018, the work undertaken was a feasibility study, then taken through to a technical detailed study to ultimately write at the time, which was following legislation, to the Secretary of State to deem whether or not our proposal was deemed to be operable and efficient and move towards public consultation. 
Back in 2020, just prior to the pandemic, we did write to the Secretary of State, and they did write back endorsing the scheme as potentially operable and efficient, which was the language used under the legislation, and for us to be able to progress to public consultation. Unfortunately, due to all of the lockdown restrictions of COVID, we were not able to progress with public consultation across the Northeast. That then paused during the COVID pandemic, and also during that time, the legislation changed. The legislation became the responsibility for the Secretary of State and the Department of Health and Social Care to consult with the public, not for local authorities to consult. So please note, in the re relation to the update I'm providing you with today, we are all consultees of the Department of Health and Social Care consultation in relation to the expansion of water fluoridation across the Northeast, of which Northumberland would be a beneficiary. And just to highlight, it is an expansion for us. We've had a number of areas fluoridated dating back to 1968 and we know the difference in relation to our children's oral health uh, in the areas that are fluoridated. So really I just want to highlight why we still recommend this and would like to support and endorse Overview and Scrutiny Committee today to click onto that link and to complete the survey of your own accord and is indeed Chair should you so wish on behalf of, of the board. Tooth decay is largely preventable but remains a serious public health problem in the North East. Tooth decay causes significant pain, discomfort and distress. It's the leading cause of hospital admissions in children aged five to nine years and is also the co cause of most dental treatments. Water fluoridation is an effective and safe public health measure. The safety of water fluoridation has been widely monitored and researched and there is no convincing scientific evidence of harm <laughs> to general health from water containing fluoride within the regulatory limits which we apply here in Britain. Many areas across the country, including the Northeast, already have fluoridated water. And you don't need to go as far as Hartlepool to see where it's naturally fluoridated, where we've got areas of similar levels of deprivation. Our children's oral health is much better than if we transpose that to areas of deprivation without fluoridated water. So fluoridation can reduce the prevalence, severity and impact of tooth decay alongside all of the other oral health promoting activities we are absolutely already delivering within Northumberland. It will reduce health inequalities, the greatest reduction in areas of highest deprivation. So with that in mind, it's also a cost-effective public health intervention and it will reap its rewards for us in years to come. So please, I do urge you all as partners and as overview and scrutiny through the Department of Health and Social Care who are leading this consultation to be a consultee and, su and support by completing the survey. Thank you. Okay, members, do you have any questions you'd like to raise at that point or comments? Um, Councillor Hill. Thank you, Chair. It's always difficult in something like this as a, as not a scientist or not an expert, but somebody that is logical and, and study, studied history, uh, including the history of, of popular medical opinion, which has often been proven to be wrong. And I'm not, I haven't got a conclusion. I'm not, you know, there's the pro and the anti argument. Um, but I certainly couldn't be confident in the premise that you seem to be coming from that is automatically a good thing. I'm not saying I absolutely disagree, but I can't be confident. And if you look at um, the... And I, it is um, medication without consent, which does in itself cause concern. So you can't monitor dosage and all the rest of it. Um, and actually, we are in the minority. So if you're looking at, you know, different opinions and stuff, I think we are very much in, in the world in a minority who do this. So from my point of view, and I'm not, you know, tying my colours to the anti, but I think, I, th I think there's some good arguments. I certainly cannot be confident and support the premise that it's automatically a good thing. <laughs> Councillor Hunter. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to ask, is the consultation going to be to the widespread public so that we can promote it so that everybody can have their say? Or is it just consultees? It is available on the government website for anyone to be able to complete. 
Councillor Bowl. Thank you, Chair. So from the consultation, for, when will we receive feedback from that and from how long from that point will we see this happen? So the consultation runs through till mid-June and then it's, it's my understanding is that it will be reviewed all through the summer and then come through in the autumn time as to what the outcome has been from that consultation. If it was to be approved by the Secretary of State based on the consultation feedback, then it would take a couple of years for it to come to fruition by the time we work with, with water companies and such like. Thank you. Is there anything else anyone wishes to add? No. Well, can I say, um, if there's a consultation link coming, can that be forwarded to all members of this committee? And I'll just say that this is a ho wholly public, so anyone out there can have whatever say they want to say on that website. They can speak to their local councillors, they can write to their MPs, all that kind of thing, can put their own comments in, and I think that would be encouraged for everyone who's got opinion on it to do so. Okay, and with that, um, the consultation link, yeah, that's right, yeah. With that, I'll, yes, I'm going to bring Councillor Jones in as the, as the Cabinet member. Am I allowed to say that? Um, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I think um, Jill said it, but I'll say it again. Tooth decay is largely preventable. Um, it causes significant pain, discomfort and distress, particularly to children. And the leading cause of hospital admissions for children aged five to nine is tooth decay. Um, and, and water fluoridation is an effective, safe uh, public health measure. Um, I have already written to all members uh, with the public, with co public consultation link, but I'm very happy to send it out again. Yeah, I think that would be welcomed, to be honest. Any information on this, welcome from my perspective as chair of this committee. Thank you. Okay, and I shall move on to the next item, which is um, item eight, which is Newcastle Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust Quality Account. It's the annual report on the quality of service. The committee is requested to receive and comment on presentation from the trust and agree to submit a formal response to each trust. And I think I've got three... Uh, three people. I've got Rob Harrison, Managing Director, Annie Laverty, Director of Patient and Staff Experience, and Caroline Docking, Director of Communications and Corporate Affairs here. And I'll pass it over to you and you can you can present in the style you like. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank you for inviting us to uh, to do this presentation. Um, we've taken the opportunity to um, to provide to you today uh, a number of. I'm hoping is this. No. Am I using the wrong button? Oh, hang on. It was not on. There we are. Well I always turn the on button. Thank you. Um, taking the opportunity just to um, to, to bring you a, a, up to speed as an overview scrutiny committee on a number of areas, including then the priority quality. Sorry, the quality priorities from 23-24, and then the ones that we will be working to in 24-25. Um, I'm going to just start with a, a bit of an update on um, where we are following the CQC um, publication that. Um, that we received in January 2024. Um, then move on to a general oversight on, on performance issues, some progress since the inspection um, that the trust has been putting into place. Um, and then I'll just touch on the quality priorities for 23, 24, and then 24, 25. I'll bring colleagues in at different points if that's okay, Chairman. Um, so first of all, just to say that the final report that was published in January 2024 overall rated the organisation as requires improvement. We were rated for um, the caring domain as good, but the well-led domain as inadequate, which clearly is uh, a major concern. Um, card the cardiothoracics um, department was received its own separate report, and that was unrated, and it highlighted issues around culture and behaviours within that part of the organisation. Um, and as a consequence of that, the Trust received something called a Notice of Decision, which placed conditions on its licence. Um, and the first and the, the main one of those was for us to implement an effective governance system within 28 days. 
There are a number of areas that were covered in the report, um, as I've touched on before in terms of cardiac surgery. Also incident reporting, so this is the method by which our staff report errors and issues within the organisation, that they were too low and that staff were not feeling able to report incidents in the way we would expect. Um, there were also concerns from whistleblowers within the organisation and staff concerns were the culture of um, speaking up and um, the fear of repercussions from speaking up. Um, and that clearly was not of um, something that we were uh, particularly, um, that was something that we were particularly concerned about um, in seeing that. Um, in addition to that, I think it's fair to say that when you read the report, it's a pretty heavy report. There's 107 must-dos, which is one of the, the largest that we've seen, um, and that there'd been quite a defensive nature in the organisation in relation to the, uh, the must-dos and the things that we needed to put right. Um, <clears throat> a number of areas to be reviewed in terms of both the way in which we operate, the leadership, the culture, and then specifically around the board's oversight of these issues and the broader ownership of issues. Um, but there were a number of good things, particularly uh, notable in terms of the staff and their practice, but there were a number of key limiters which I've touched on uh, before, in particular the, the leadership approach and the well-led domain. So what did that do? That, that led to us being placed into something called um, Soft 3, which is one of four ratings, so you can either be uh, one through to four, um, with Soft 3 being the, the second from bottom. We were moved into tier one for um, our performance around cancer and electives, which places in the highest tiering of support um, to improve our waiting times. Um, and, um, and then, as I've mentioned before, there are a number of areas in relation to the CQC concerns, but specifically culture and incident reporting. Um, and also the trust um, moved into a more difficult financial position during this period alongside that. So all of that contributes to the oversight framework rating of soft three. There was clear expectations um, <clears throat> of us from the, as a major regional centre um, and, and the way in which we support other partners, being a large teaching hospital in the North East, and therefore um, clear involvement from commissioners and other regulatory bodies at this point. So um, set about undertaking a whole board's award um, review, of fully in, uh, looking at our integrated governance systems, um, and um, quite a, an extensive period of change in terms of some of the trust leadership. Um, and Sir Jim Mackey sends his apologies that he's not able to be here today, but he was newly appointed as chief executive at the turn of the year. And then a number of us, including Annie and myself, joined fairly soon after to be part of an interim team that's looking to try and make improvements on the position at Newcastle Hospitals. Um, we've gone through, in that short period of time, a full review of the organisation's governance, We've undertaken a review of the board and the committees, uh, the frequency of committee meetings, the frequency of board meetings, the approach to how they function, the composition and skills of the board, with a number of changes still actually in train at this stage. Um, we've shifted the quality committee to be more focused and to take place on a monthly basis rather than bi-monthly. Um, and we've put in place a number of other committees to start to deal with some of the issues that were highlighted in the CQC report particularly some of the issues that we had around digital technology within the organisation and the impact that that was having on clinical staff. We've set about doing quite a lot in terms of simplification and streamlining. There was a lot of bureaucracy in the approach to how things are being done and looking to try and make sure that we could do things in a much clearer and more effective way, devolving leadership more into the organisation and using the skills of the people across the organisation to, to put some of these things right. Um, <clears throat> we've made sure that it's really clear that we as a leadership team own this and that we're clear about how we will actually come through this to make sure that we get things into the right place. So the, the governance rewrite has been going very well. We have some clinical boards within the organisation, eight of them, which are our devolved units for um, how we run the organisation. And those boards have been receiving support and development and have fully embraced the challenge that's ahead. Um, we've been putting in some clear planning and, um, and priority work for those clinical boards and also starting to develop the data and evidence that we can use to support the compliance and the assurance to show that we're making that good progress in certain areas. We've had um, a number of action plans in the past, but we've consolidated those and been really clear about the approach we're taking to dealing with the must-dos that the CQC highlighted, 
but also those important areas that, um, that I've highlighted before in terms of cardiac services, emergency department, medicines management, and the broader cultural issues as well. And we've begun our in, in engagement approach with the CQC um, with meetings um, earlier on, but through specifically to one of the uh, a direct engagement event on the 24th of April, and then building up to the 28th of June, when we're hoping that we'll be able to move towards some of those restrictions on our license being removed. Um, there's clearly more work to do, and we're uh, particularly ongoing around the, the trust board itself and the committee cycle and approach, and we've had some further changes to our non-executive directors, which have happened in the last week or so. Um, importantly, we've also made progress around um, freedom to speak up in the organisation and encouraging staff to be able to feel free to speak up, to talk about the things that they may be finding difficult. Um, so Jim has led on a wide range of staff engagement um, events to make sure that our staff can start to feel heard, that we're listening to what they're saying, and we've started to develop from that a series of um, big signals that I'll come to in a moment about the things that we as a board will commit to do to support our staff and also uh, to the population that we serve. Um, and in line with last year's quality priorities, we've gone further and faster on making sure that we have a strong focus on patient safety and implement the new PISA framework that um, is the new approach nationally to supporting improvements in safety of, of care within, in, within a healthcare setting. So in terms of speaking up safely, we've appointed a new um, uh, Freedom to Speak Up officer. Um, they've taken up the role and they're dedicated to supporting staff to make sure that um, they feel safe to speak up if they don't want to go through the traditional line management routes. As I've said, um, Sir Jim has been doing quite a lot of roadshows. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons he's not here. He's out meeting staff at the moment. Um, and really promoting the approach to how we engage all our colleagues across the organisation to make sure that not only we're hearing the things that they need us to hear as board members so that we can seek to put them right, but also to ensure that they are part of the solution, that they're empowered and that they can take things forward themselves. Um, <clears throat> we've been providing a support mechanism through a working confidence system which allows staff to, uh, to, to provide feedback either um, openly or if they need to do so, they can do so anonymously. That allows us to have direct engagement between executive team members and staff. Um, we receive those, um, so I, I have a login and I can receive those um, and then are able to feed back to those staff even if they're anonymous, it's actually done through an anonymous system where I can collect the feedback, I can send that back to them and they receive it personally. Um, and we've put that in place to make sure that we can do so. And then a number of one-to-one -one meetings across the board with directors, um, Sir Jim himself personally, um, with staff members who've requested that as well. We're focused on ensuring that we put in place a civility charter to support um, equality, diversity, inclusion as well, but also to really... Um, embrace the national research that's been done around civility being a positive thing to have in place in a healthcare setting, that it improves performance, it improves patient care um, and ensures that we provide the best possible services. I'm going to hand over to Annie now who's going to talk to you about some of the novel work that she's leading on. Okay, thanks Rob. And so as Rob has already mentioned, one of the things that we really wanted to commit to was listening well to patients and to staff understanding what their issues were and, and how we work with them to respond. So Rob and I are relatively new in post, as he's mentioned. I think this is about week 11. Um, but we thought it was really important early on, about 100 days into um, Sir Jim's tenure, to just get an early survey out to staff to understand the emotions across the organisation, given the amount of change that had taken place. So we did it very quickly. It was a relatively short survey, and we did it in April. Um, and we got 4,500 4 responses in that short period of time, which we were absolutely delighted with. It allows us to be very confident about the results. We were able to triangulate the results that we were seeing with some of the performance nationally with other organizations and, and benchmark that. That's been really important. And none of this data that you see on the slide is where we want it to be in terms of representing the organization that we'll all be proud to work for. We want to be in a place where far more than 47% of our staff feel able to recommend the organization as a place to work. 
And we want to feel able to connect people to the purpose of work, the things that allows them to feel proud of the work that they do and that care of patients is the number one priority and they can see that in all the behaviours of the organisation. We asked those 4,500 staff that responded to the survey in April, have you actually noticed any change in the last three months since the new leadership team have come into place? Um, and nearly 2,000 staff, around about 50%, had seen changes. 83% um, of those staff believe that those changes were for the better, either slightly or, or much better. So that's encouraging green shoots. Absolutely recognition for all the work that we have still to do, but encouraging that people were nonetheless starting to see the benefits of all of the things put in place that Rob had described earlier. There you go. Thank you, Annie. So um, a couple of things just to cover, and then we'll move into the quality prices themselves from last year and, um, and, and next year. Um, first thing in terms of um, the year just ended, we managed to uh, balance the books. Quite importantly, though, beyond that, um, we've got uh, a really significant deficit position that we're looking at for this forthcoming year that we're currently working on to try and make sure that we can mitigate that as much as possible. So the original deficit predicted for this year was £80 million. Um, the current plan takes us to a £40 million deficit, and we obviously continue to work on that to try and improve that um, as we move forward. In that time period, though, so in this last 100 days, we've had really great um, progress on elective care and cancer care, and we've actually managed to come out of Tier 1. We've been de-escalated completely out of the national tiering system, which is the fastest that any trust has come out of that. And that's on the back of the hard work of all the staff through the final quarter from January to the end of March, um, really trying to um, do as much additional patient care as we possibly could to reduce the cancer backlog, which we've done significantly, and to reduce the number of long-waiting uh, long patients beyond 78 weeks. We're now focused on um, trying to bring that down further, so we'll be really focused on reducing that to 65 weeks and then below a year um, hopefully by the end of this financial year. I'll click past that. But the, um, I mentioned earlier in terms of the big signals, these are the eight things that, from all of the engagement work we've been doing, that, we, that our staff want us to really focus on. And these are what we'll be looking to adopt as a board to say these are the things that we will um, hold ourselves to account and the staff can hold us to account for delivering this year. And no surprise there, the first one is around the quality of care being our main priority and really focusing on driving that up and making sure that we um, improve on our safety approach, incident reporting, importantly listening and learning from both staff and patients, which is something that Annie, uh, I'll hand back to Annie to talk about in a moment as well. We want this to be a great place to work. We employ over 16,000 staff. Um, that's a huge employer in the, in, in the area. Um, and we want to make sure that our staff feel supported and able to come to work and do the best job that they can. We know that, the, that when our staff are in a positive place, they will give better care. There's lots of research evidence that demonstrates that the happier and um, more respected staff are at work, the better care they provide to their patients. So that's a real clear focus for us. Um, we'll restore that focus on excellence. You know, we are a, a centre that provides some of the care that, that there are, no one else provides in the North East. And so it's really important that we do that well. We need to improve on technology. We need to improve some of our buildings and the estate and the environment that our patients are cared for in. Um, and we'll take our responsibilities as a public service really seriously. So that means looking after our patients and each other. It means managing our money well. It, Im it means improving our performance um, and also our relationships with our partner organisations as well. Um, and our communities depend on us, as it says here, as a major uh, regional centre, as a key city partner um, in, in Newcastle, uh, and a compassionate employer as well. And so we really acknowledge that responsibility and we want to make sure that we deliver on those commitments. Um, and clearly, what we've learned from the CQC report is that we weren't a learning organisation. We're not an organisation that was really focused on trying to improve in the right way and taking on board the, the, um, the, the areas where we've maybe not done as well as we should. And therefore, we want to commit to making sure that we, we really do learn from the things that we uh, need to, that we're open and we're honest and we're transparent about the things that we're, we're challenged by, but that we can then demonstrate progress on those. 
So just touching on the 23-24 um, quality priorities, these were split into three areas, patient safety, clinical effectiveness and experience. And as you can see on here, um, there was progress in all of them, which is why they're rated as, uh, as kind of yellow amber. But there was really only one that we actually managed to achieve um, a, a full uh, green um, outcome for, which was the, the triage in the maternity assessment unit. Having looked at these, there are a number of these where we continue to work um, in these areas, and we've actually managed to go further following the end of the year. So, for instance, in patient safety, the implementation of the National Patient Safety Strategy, we've actually done post the year, we've pretty much concluded that work, and we've rolled that out across the organisation um, since April. Um, but there are some here that we will continue to work on to make sure that we improve, including things around um, mental capacity assessments, deprivation of liberty, um, further work in terms of um, the maternity assessment unit, and we're bringing some of those into this year's quality priorities to make sure that they're really clear. But we've, looking at 24-25, uh, we've reduced the quality priorities down to five really clear areas so that we can make sure that we focus on those, and no surprises, they do relate to some of the things that have come up through the CQC and from our staff as well about what they want to see improvements in and where our patients are saying they need to see improvements as well. So I'll just run through them very quickly, but then I'm going to get Annie to talk to one of these because it's, it's probably one of the most important ones that will help us to, to move forward. So the first one is, is to improve patient safety, ensuring that we do ensure that our staff feel free to report incidents near misses and that we learn from them and therefore that we improve the incident reporting rates. And we know that if we can generate incident reports that that will allow us to learn that will allow us to improve patient safety and make sure that we move forward in, and provide services in a, in a higher quality way the second area is to reduce the incidence of surgical never events and specifically we had have had some issues in the ophthalmology department where we're finding that um, some of the practice in there has meant that we're not as secure as we need to be on this so again learning from elsewhere learning from what other places have done to improve this and making sure that we improve practice and then spread beyond ophthalmology into other departments. The third one is to ensure reasonable adjustments are made for our patients with suspected um, or known learning disabilities or autism, um, and to ensure that we've also got the appropriate use of the mental capacity assessment and deprivation of liberty safeguards for patients with vulnerabilities within the organisation. The fourth one I'll come back to, this is one that Annie's just going to expand on, um, and then the fifth area is um, it, it, we have a new midwifery leadership team starting um, and one of the really clear and important things that we want to re-establish is the, the staffing model for the birthing unit um, on the Royal Victoria Infirmary site, ensuring that that plan means that it's recurrently open, that the birthing, birthing centre, um, which has historically been opening and closing regularly, can be consistently available to, uh, to new, to new mums so that there's no fear that they're going to be diverted to another unit um, at short notice. It's a really important um, thing for us to establish and make sure that it's in place. We've been working really hard in recruiting new midwives and then ensuring that they're trained well before we get it reopened. But that is one of the, the really key priorities for us for this year. I'll pass to Annie just to talk through the fourth one. I'm not, take, I'm not taking any comments. Thanks very much. So as Director of Patient Experience, one of the reasons that um, I've been brought into the Trust, actually, um, in this role, there's only two in the NHS, um, is to focus very, very specifically on how do we improve patient and staff experience together. So we've got an ambition for um, a very, very large programme and to roll that out across Newcastle hospitals. Um, I've already started to share with you um, an early ambition to tap into the emotions of staff and we'll, we'll establish that as a regular program going forward. But for patient experience, what does it mean? Well, we're going to do two main things. The first of it is to establish what we call our real-time program and that means interviewing, sitting by the bedside and understanding the experience of patients whilst they're still with us 
in hospital. And the reason that we want to do that in real time is to get that back to our clinical teams immediately. Within hours of speaking to patients, we can feed that information back to clinical teams. That does two things. One, it allows teams to understand what they're doing right so that they do it more often. The second is it allows us to fix things quickly when there are things that patients tell us could be better. So using this in another organization, we halved our complaints between 2009 and 2014 because we were nipping things in the bud, because we were finding out early doors, what could be better. So we're going to be rolling out a real-time program that's about training an independent team to have those conversations with our patients while they're still with us and then feed that information back to staff. Our right time program recognizes that it's actually two weeks after care when patients are at their least happy. They go home again, they're back in control perhaps, and they reflect on the whole experience. So working with um, a company in Oxford, we are going to deliberately target that two week after transfer out of hospital and survey um, patients to a large extent. That means 20% of all outpatients, 10% of all people in acute hospital beds, all of our users of maternity services, 10% of people using emergency care. That equates to, based on our activity, between 25 and 30,000 people every month will be seeking feedback from. And that will give us a huge data set across the organization. We'll be able to look at that at a ward level, at a team level, at a specialty level, across our clinical boards. Is there a difference between our hospital sites? And we'll also, within that large data set, be able to analyze that data for groups represented by protected characteristics to see if there's any inequity in our data that we feel is unfair in our provision of care. So a really exciting program. It will mean a lot to our staff, um, all of us who went into healthcare, and I did more than 30 years ago, um, do so because we want to deliver something positive for patients. And a feedback mechanism that gets that information back quickly is really good for staff morale, as well as improving the quality of care. So it's a big ambition for our quality priority, and it will underpin a number of the priorities that you see on the slide here. Thanks, Rob. So thank you, Chair, for allowing us to come today. Hopefully that gives you a good sense of um, the things that um, Newcastle hospitals are focused on, the progress we've made to date post the CQC um, um, report, but also then what we're really focusing on over the next 12 months with a view to increasing the quality of care that we provide and how we will do that through engaging our staff and in particular how we'll be doing that engaging our patients as well. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm now going to invite um, the committees to come in on this. So, Councillor Hill, I can see you've got your hand up. Councillor Hill. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. A couple of short points and a couple of quick questions. Obviously, this is profoundly disappointing and unsettling, this, this report. Um, it's concerning, as you've mentioned, and I don't think you can overstate how concerning it is in the backdrop of you know, the post office scandal and what continually happens, the, the treatment of whistleblowers. I think the NHS is probably one of the few organisations that's even worse than local government in the treatment of people who complain. Um, a couple of questions. Firstly, on the list of audits, there were some things that weren't audited because they, you don't provide that service, which is obviously fair enough. But the things like, I think, it's such a long document, I, I lost my place, but I think brain learning difficulties in cardiology, there, there's no audit done in those areas. So firstly, could I have an explanation on that. The most important point in question is, if you recall last year, I raised the issue of uh, cancer waiting times, which were really poor. Um, and I was, we were given an assurance it will be better next year. Um, and I said, so when we talk about this next year, it will be better. And it's not. Um, so if I look at the stat, for example, for the national target of 62 days from referral to treatment, the national target is 85%. Um, 
and it's 55.5%. Last year, it's 53.4%. So the improvement has been 1.1%, which is probably a natural um, flip back, if you like, after um, after COVID. So no, I don't think any calculation you could say that that's a significant improvement. So not much more than half people are receiving treatment, at, which, and this is related to things like urgent suspected cancer within the national 62-day referral. So that's really worrying. You didn't mention it in your presentation. And how can we be confident? You, you know, you've said this is bad, but we're going to be doing this and that, we're going to improve it. But we had that assurance last year on the important issue of cancer waiting times, and the improvement is 1.1%. So there's, And as I say, that's probably just related to backlog after COVID. So it's hugely disappointing, and I really want some grounds, because I'm struggling to find anyone, to be confident that things are going to improve, particularly regarding cancer waiting times. Thank you. Uh, if I just take the cancer waiting times first, then I'll bring Caroline in on your, your other point. So um, I, I totally agree that the cancer waiting times are not where they need to be. What we've focused on, is there's two, two aspects to cancer waiting times. There's those patients who receive their care within 62 days, and then there are also those patients who wait longer than 62 days. Um, we've been focusing on, in the last um, three and a half months, reducing the number of patients who are beyond 62 days. So that's when I referred to very briefly in the presentation of reducing the cancer backlog. That's, that is the group of patients who've gone beyond 62 days for their treatment. And during that period, we've reduced that quite significantly and nearly halved it. Um, and we've done that on purpose because that group are waiting the longest. That will then, over time, start to have an impact on the total number of patients, the proportion of them that receive their care within 62 days. Um, this is not straightforward to, to turn around at all but it is part of what we will be absolutely aiming to do this year. Uh, I recognise you were given those assurances last year, um, but we're very focused on this, and that's one of the reasons why early doors, so Jim, um, you know, set this out as, a, as something we wanted to do, was to really demonstrate that we could move on reducing the longest waits for elective care and the longest waits for cancer care, um, which, is, which is what we have been able to do, and that's why we've now been removed out of the national tiering um, support mechanism because they recognise the improvements we've made in, that, in the first three months of this calendar year. Um, there is further to go, there is a lot more work to do, and we'll continue to really focus on that over the next um, 12 months as well. Okay. Can I just bring Caroline in on the other okay. point? Is that okay? Can I just squeeze in about the yeah, audit um, point? So you're right, in the quality account, it lists a, a full list of all the national audits that we've taken part in, and those where we haven't. Now, where we haven't taken part in the national audit, there will be other local audits that we have completed. If you'd like, I can come back to you with a written answer around specifically what's happened in those areas. Which um, specialties did you ask about? Sorry. I, I just noticed, I think, as explained, it was the United We'll come back to you with a... We'll come back to you with a written answer. Okay. I've got Caroline Ball. Thanks, Chair. So, again... I am shocked to see some of the information and hear some of the information. Um, and I don't know about other members, but at no point have I had a member of the public saying, you know what it is, you know what we need, another line of management and directors, um, which seems to be the answer to some of the problems here. So did you not have a director that was dealing with some of the whistleblowing and stuff like that previously? If not, what's happened within that setup now because I just almost feel that if the problem was there adding another line of management or a director isn't actually helping that problem um you mentioned about filtering down some of the responsibility down the tiers is that not putting more pressure on the workforce as well to not be able to do their job or have that extra layer of stress and responsibility and I'm just wondering with the consultation what kind of questions will you be asking because if you turn around and ask in a ward, my mum was recently in hospital, and if anybody turned around to me and went, how was the staff? And she would turn around and go, overstretched, but absolutely lovely, and did the best that they could. So when it comes down to assessment, tick, tick, tick. But the reality is that there would be 101 things that could probably have been done better as well. So I, I think when it comes down to consultation, it can be swerved, to be the way that you to be end up being very positive. 
Um, so I'm just wondering what kind of questions that you will be asking people. And what's the commitment of the staff of 47.5 are saying that they don't have the tools to do the job? That seems like a pretty basic thing to me because you can't change a tyre with a knife and fork. You need the proper tools to do your job. So what's the commitment of the staff when they do turn around on Monday and say, I need this? What is the commitment to actually get that done? Because to me, it seems like it's top heavy on some of the management and consultants and da 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 when actually we need some more frontline staff and the basic tools to get the job done as well. Thank you. Thanks. If I maybe just pick up a couple of these. So just on the first point, it's not an additional layer. This is change of people, um, turning over um, a number of key posts across the organisation. It's not extra, um, but there are a number of people who have left in the senior director roles um, and they've been replaced by other individuals. There is a slightly different focus on some of our roles. Um, and in particular, I think Annie's role is a very different role to what we've had before in the organisation um, and has a proven methodology that has demonstrated in other organisations uh, a real improvement in the care that staff are able to provide and the, the care that, that patients receive, which is why Annie's bringing that methodology into the organisation. In relation specifically to the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian, that's not a, a role at director level. That is an individual in the organisation and all NHS organisations are required to have this role. We're revamping that, we're republicising it because what we recognise is that there was um, clear concerns both in the CQC report and what, what as new directors we're finding just being out and about meeting with staff is a concern about their, how they feel able to speak up about things that maybe um, you know, the report mentions bullying and other things in there that they didn't feel able to call out and therefore we're trying to make sure that it's really easy for people to do so. And specifically on some of those things, you know, Sir Jim has met with some of the whistleblowing team, you know, the people who have kind of been involved previously. Um, he's got ongoing meetings with them to make sure that we are listening to what's gone on and, and you know, what's happened in the past, because we want to make sure that going forward, those things don't, don't get repeated. Um, and, um, and therefore, we're engaging directly. We're not trying to avoid, we're not trying to swerve. We're absolutely engaging people where they wish to be engaged um, directly. I don't know if, Annie, you want to just come in on... Yeah, I, if I can come in about the questions you asked. So you're right, this isn't a tech box exercise. It won't help us get better if we try and skew the questions that we ask. So the questions that we ask are based on evidence. It's based on research that shows the things that people care about when they're lying in a hospital bed, the things that they want us to get right. So. If your mum was there in hospital, we would have sat beside her and we would have found out how she felt about the staff. And we would have found out that she was concerned that there perhaps weren't enough staff on duty. We would have asked her about her pain. We would have asked her about her perceptions of the cleanliness on the unit and her confidence around that, particularly important as people recover from a pandemic and public confidence in that. We will ask her if when she rang the bell, how long it took to get somebody to come and, come and see her. We'll ask her about the relationships that she saw in the team in front of her and how confident she was that she was getting the care. And was she involved and was family involved in the way that she want, they wanted them to. So there's a, st there's a key set of measures that are evidence-based, grounded in improvement, and standardised across the organisation. So we're not picking and choosing what it is that we need to be better. And we're bringing in a methodology that has been implemented in another organisation since 2009 and demonstrated to be effective. So really, really important that we get to the heart of the experience and not just judge good relationships, because generally the relationships between patients and, and staff will be good. And the CQC findings were that the care was, was of a good standard. So I hope that helps a little bit, that we are going to be deliberately curious about what we ask and what we aim to improve. And I think what's important with that is, you know, we are stewards of public money, like yeah. local authorities. So we have to work through ensuring we gather as much information as possible to where we direct that resource, which absolutely speaks to your point about having the tools to do your job. Are we putting things in the right place? Have we got the staff in the right place? We use a range of metrics, but you know, including professional judgment, but actually also having those feedback mechanisms to know actually we've got it right or we haven't quite got it right. 
and, and how we then use that resource really effectively. But as with all public sector services, we've got a level of resource that is there for us to use. We need to use it to the best of our ability and to try and make sure that we're using the right evidence to determine where to put it. Yep, come back. Just with regards to the commitment of when things are shown up to be wrong, actually timescales and what commitment is there, there to actually, because it's all well and good, because I think we can say, oh, well, we know we've got a problem. But if you don't do anything about it, it's still going to be a problem next year. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, hopefully you'll see there from the progress we've made just from January about the things that we committed to do, the improvements we sought to make. We've done a lot of those already. Clearly, as we go forward, there'll be more things that will come out from this work. There's no point in doing the work that Annie's describing if you're not then prepared to follow through and commit to actually make improvements on the back of it. We'll use different ways of doing so, but you know, I don't know if you want to come in, Annie. Just well, well, another key commitment is about transparency, and we've chosen to share all this information with you today deliberately. Outside all of our hospital wards will be the feedback that we get from patients as well as the feedback that we get from staff. That commitment to transparency is also a commitment to improvement. Um, the braver we are with sharing information that isn't where we want it to be, the faster we are at acting on that feedback and, and making it better. Hopefully, you'll, those of you who might have seen a quality account presentation from us before will see the difference in the approach that we've taken to make it much more holistic and much more practical. Um, we hope that's welcome, but you know, if you've got any feedback on that for us, we'd happily take it on board. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hunter. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I think like other councillors, it's disappointing to see the, the result from CQC. And I appreciate your reviewing your committees and boards as well. But the patients, all they're looking for really is how quick can we get the treatment and how can we get appointment. And again, I think it's that thank you to the staff when they're doing things right, allowing them to speak up and say, yes, we've got a problem, but if they've done something right, that's, that, that's good. On the surveys, especially on the two-week ones, will they be identified as, you know, Mrs Smith has said X? Because sometimes patients don't always want to speak up and say, if there's something wrong, yes, they'll maybe speak up and say, yes, I had a good experience, X and Y was good. But it allows them to be more honest with their feedback because you can only sort a problem if you know what the problem is. No, we have a 100% commitment to confidentiality, and that's really, really important from both a staff and a patient point of view. If a patient tells us something that we think might identify them as an individual, we will share that back with them immediately and say, you do realise that's going to identify you on the ward. Would you still like me to include that statement or not? So that, that it's in their hands in terms of information. Some people have no problem at all being named and you know very, very explicit about the feedback that they give. But we'll absolutely protect it. The success of our programme depends on that. Right. I've got counsel in this bit. Isabel did ask my question then, but I've, there's another one here. Um, you've got 16,000 staff, and yet you've only had 4,575 uh, responded to the house. So how are you going to capture what the other 11,000 really? You know what I mean? You've got 83% are saying it's 73% saying it's a little bit better, and then you've said you put things in place to improve a bit more. So hopefully by next year we'll see a great improvement on there. But it's just how will you how will you gather the the rest of the staff's responses because it seems as though they're left out in it. And if you know it's great to capture as many as you can rather than just a few because that's just about a quarter of your staff really. Yeah, you know? no, you're absolutely right. And we want as many people engaging in the programme as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and we want to give people as many opportunities in a variety of ways. So the survey was just one option. The roadshows were another. We had focus groups running simultaneously. Not everybody wants to use an electronic mechanism of giving feedback. So we'll have a whole range of things. In terms of the data, though, if I can share, that when you achieve a certain number of responses, statistically... <laughs> it allows you to be very confident of those results. So if we got 4,500 responses, if we spoke to another 4,500 people, they will tell us roughly the same things. We'll get the same experiences. So in terms of pure stats, we can be 
99% confident that those results are absolutely true, regardless if we spoke to 4,500 4 staff or 12,000 staff or indeed 16,000 staff. But from an engagement point of view, your point is absolutely right. We want to cover the organisation as much as possible. We're going to find it easy. So one of the ways is um, dropping in on, say, the porters, for example, don't rely on a paper survey to come back to you on an electronic survey. Drop in on teams and find out their experiences. Engagement goes, you know, allows us to cover, use a multiple of tools to get the answers that we want to understand in a variety of ways. But can I, in front, as I've said to our own board, can I be really confident about those results having achieved four and a half thousand responses in three weeks? Absolutely. Okay, do I have any other further comments or questions? Okay, so we've got a note, a formal response, don't we, um, Chris? Yeah, so I will write up a formal response which I'll share with the Trust um, after this. And I'm sure that will be based on what our, conversation, our debate has been and questions here. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for your presentation. Um, and... Uh, you can either stay if you want or you can get yourselves off or whatever you prefer but we're, we're boldly going through our the rest of our in the Star Trek way we're going to boldly go on to item 9 on the, gen, the agenda which is Cumbria, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir NHS um, FT quality accounts the annual report of the quality of service the committee is requested to receive and comment on the presentation from the trust and agree to submit a formal response to each trust and that is a um, presentation from Chloe Mann. Chloe. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you for letting me come along this afternoon. So um, I just want to give an overview of last year's quality priorities um, and where we've gotten to with these um, over that period of time. We linked our quality priorities to um, the quality domains across the organisation. As you can see, we had a number under each area, and I'll go through them now in a little bit more detail. Oops, it's just jump, sorry. Sorry. Um, so quality priority one was about us reducing restrictive practice. We set out to achieve um, a reduction in the, the use of restrictive interventions, reduce the use of prone restraint, long-term segregation, and improve our training and education offer to all relevant staff around trauma-informed care, human rights, and HOPE's clinical model. In terms of progress, the, um, the Trust has reduced its segregation by an average 50 to 75 per cent in the last two, two years. We've made great progress in terms of that. Prone restraint has reduced during the last period, and we've been successful in, drain, in, in delivering training across a number of different areas. In terms of the HOPES clinical model, we now have um, 24 staff who are able to deliver that full package across the organisation. Um, and then, as you can see, we've managed to deliver the two-day training and the awareness session to a number of staff across the Trust. We've got a trauma-informed care lead appointed, um, Rebecca Courtney Walker, who's one of our senior psychologists in the organisation. And we held a launch event at the Trust Leadership Forum with managers during March 2024. Quality priority two was around therapeutic engagement and observation, which is a significant part of the work we do as a mental health organisation. We set out to improve our training and education offer across our staff who undertake engagement and observation, the quality of what we're providing and reviewing the, pro the approach we use towards engagement and observation. We've had a full policy review, which has been updated um, with significant changes over the last year. The new training package was launched and we're on target to achieve for 95% of staff to be compliant with this. We've changed our audit tools and techniques to look at the compliance arrangements in place across the CVUs, which are our clinical business units, where improvements are required, and we're continuously learning um, through any incidents that occur and updating our training and policies as required. We're also ensuring that clinical observations discussed as part of clinical supervision. Quality priority three was around reducing waiting times in our children and young people's services. That's mental health and the neurodevelopmental pathway. Um, the, we've um, had a, a 
Tuscan Finnish group um, across the organisation, looking at the different waiting time um, standards, looking at the different practices across each area, and working closely with the ICB to look at um, proposals around reducing the longest waiters, because we know that this is a, um, a significant um, issue across the, the whole of England, really, in terms of the demand on services um, and the need for that service to be really timely. Um, in terms of the pathway redesign work, that's been um, complete and it's been endorsed by our executive management group and it's going to be implemented with partners during the course of the next financial year. Ensuring we've got a standardised approach across CNTW because it did vary and depend on which locality you lived in. Ongoing investment to secure third sector support for improvement across access and waiting times um, and across our pathways with place-based commissioners and partners. We know that a system-based approach to supporting our children and young people will give us the most success in getting them timely treatment and intervention where needed. This is a snapshot of our Northumberland children and young people's waiting times. Um, as you can see, over the course of the last two years, we've had a significant increase in demand on our services, um, with quarter four seeing us have um, a waiting list of 945 young people. We continue to strive to see children and young people at the earliest opportunity. Um, for our mental health pathway, currently the average waiting time is four weeks in Northumberland. Um, and for our overall service, including neurodevelopmental, it's an average waiting time of 10 weeks. Um, we're moving towards the new four-week wait standard um, across the organisation. Um, so that will continue to be the challenge going into um, the next year. Quality priority four was around the implementation of the Patient Safety Incidents Response Framework, also known as PSURF. Um, it's around us delivering a more compassionate and engagement um, involvement for anyone that's affected by a patient safety incident, whether that's the individual, families, carers, or um, wider organisations that may become involved. Um, an application of a system-based approach to learning um, from patient safety incidents and considering proportionate responses to patient <coughs> safety incidents. It's around having improved and supportive oversight focused on strengthening the system and function. We've got a core team um, established um, to deliver on this priority and it is going to be a priority going into this um, next year, as you'll see when I come on to that. And we've got six work streams established to give dedicated time and support to ensure that we get this national program um, up and running as robustly as possible. We've had engagement with our staff, service users and carers, um, and we'll continue to do that going forward. Our new plan and policy was approved by the board and the ICB, and we officially went live in January this year. We've had 600 of our staff trained in the new approaches to investigation, because it is something um, quite different to what we've been used to. Quality priority five was the closed cultures um, priority. We want to um, establish a, a live dashboard in order for us to know um, any warning signs or triggers across our inpatient services. Um, that is ready for a, so a soft launch and has been tested for full rollout this next year. We know that visibility um, of leaders and um, just out of hours, not just nine to five, in terms of um, having that access, direct access for the staff, the frontline staff, patients and carers, to be able to raise any concerns at the earliest opportunity, and we've managed to put that in place. We have a large cohort of healthcare assistants work for our organisation, and we're going to have a dedicated development programme that's going to start in quarter one to really focus um, on providing them with a, really, um, with a rounded training package and support plan. We've provided a full response to the Eden field learning. Um, we always benchmark ourselves with any learning that comes out of any other organisation, whether that's CQC reports or things that haven't gone well, to ensure that we know any areas of learning that we need to embed in our organisation. And um, again, I've just outlined the different domains there where we'll be continuing to um, progress in the, in the forthcoming year. Quality priority six was in implementing a governance review throughout the organisation. Um, there was an internal well-led assessment by the CQC um, undertaken by the board. Um, and um, we've done a full refresh of our governance structure. Um, ongoing discussions continue through the trust leadership programme. And um, our internal audit um, review has um, 
give feedback in terms of how we're managing risk currently. Um, we'll be reporting that going forward as well. Quality priority seven, and this was the last pri priority from last year, and this was reducing our reliance on unregistered agency staff. Um, there was a national agency cap directive of £1.2 million per month, um, and we have um, more than achieved that um, as a trajectory. We want to continue bringing our agency workforce down. We know that temporary staff um, versus substantive staff in the workplace, um, what, in terms of quality and safety, we want to just keep bringing that figure down further and further. Um, we've done a lot of work around our inpatient staffing model to help support this um, and support the, the, the substantive staff on the ward. Um, but we have hit the trajectory that was requested in terms of um, bringing that down. So in terms of our quality priorities going forward um, for 2024 to 2025, um, we've de developed these in line with our trust strategy with you in mind. And we've got five strategic ambitions. Quality care every day, person-led care when and where it's needed, a great place to work, sustainable for the long term and innovating every day, and working with and for our communities. Ambition one of our strategies is what is included in our quality priorities and the development of the deliverables and measures will be developed in this first quarter. This is what we've done in terms of engagement to get to where we are um, in terms of devising what will be our quality priorities. And as you can see, we've took it through a number of different forums to have it as to, to capture a widespread audience in terms of engagement um, to get where we are today. So here's just a bit more detail on what we plan to do in the next year. So like I said, our PSURF um, priority will be an ongoing one for this year. We've, we've made great progress in um, the first year of that, but there's still work to do. We want to deliver on the key learning from safety improvement themes, including reducing violence and aggression, improving the physical health care for all of our patients, we want to see a reduction in suicides and continue to reduce restrictive practice. We want to ensure that the six principles of triangle of care are fully embedded throughout the organisation. We know how crucial carers are in terms of delivering successful care and treatment to our patients. And we really want to make sure that those principles are really wrapped around the individual. We want to continue to embed learning through research and informing and improving our care delivery and embed a culture of trauma-informed care and its approaches across the organisation. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Chloe. Um, do we have any questions from the committee? <laughs> Councillor Ball. Just with some of the time frames, you were saying that something's going to change from like down to two weeks. Um, I know one of the things that I've had residents mention is they get to see someone, but then they're still waiting a long time for the next step. So will that almost take away from trying to get as many people as you can within that two-week window, but actually not leading to treatment and support? Because without the other, it's, it's not saying it's pointless to not have that first step, but without that next stage and somewhere to go to, um, yeah. So and just, uh, have we got, an, is there enough staff to be able to do both? So the, the four-week wait is a wait to treatment, so not just that first contact and assessment, because I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. It's all great seeing somebody doing an assessment, but then leaving them for a significant period of time isn't helpful. Um, so this will hopefully um, allow us to do that first contact and then provide treatment within a really short space of time. And that's why we've had to do a full review um, of the, the model of care um, and in terms of staff, it is a challenge in terms of recruiting um, staff across all professions. And I'm probably not just speaking for mental health, I think across all of healthcare. Um, we don't have a significant amount of vacancies in the Northumberland area at this point in time. We have been really successful with our recruitment. And I think it's really important that we workforce plan and look at actually what do we need at this point in time and not just focus on we need nurses or doctors. We've got lots of other professions that can really support delivering excellent quality care. Quality care. Um, sorry, I've got really sore throat. Um, so we don't have an abundance of staff, but we'll be certainly striving to um, be as fully recruited as possible. And again, linking it to the temporary staff and trying to avoid using that where possible. Okay, anyone else? Councillor Hunter.
Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it's the thought of how we've got the knife crime across the country and it's rising, and it could be through mental health and fear, that, and that could put more pressure on it. I know, luckily, in Northumberland, we haven't seen that rise, but again, that could put pressure. And if you've got limited staff, because it is a possible call out for help, and it's that if they're having to wait longer, it's putting pressure on them if they've got mental health problems. I don't think we've got limited staff. That may have been the way I articulated myself. Um, it's staffing is a challenge across the board. And I think um, in terms of risk assessment and knife crime, we have, um, it wasn't part of, of the quality priorities, but we have launched a full new risk assessment process. Um, it's called the biopsychosocial risk assessment. And it's very much around that whole person and looking at all of the risks. So that type of assessment would be done with somebody at the earliest opportunity which would hopefully allow us um, a greater um, breadth of information about the individual and obviously being able to try and pick up on any of those key risks that we would want to mitigate at the earliest opportunity to keep people safe. Anyone else? Anyone else? Well, if there's no one else, I've got a question myself. And it's to do with the police and their response to mental health issues, where police have more or less said they're not going to prioritise going to look at mental health issues when someone's called 999 or what have we. They're going to prioritise other things. Is that, are we seeing any kind of run down the channel in terms of that change of priorities from them to, your, to ourselves? So would this be in relation to the Right Care, Right Person initiative that's um, been brought on us in December? Um, we work very closely with the police. Um, we have excellent working relationships in terms of escalating any concerns. We've put a significant amount of work in with regards to the implementation of Right Care, Right Person due to those concerns that people wouldn't respond or the police wouldn't respond. Um, and I have to say, we review all of our incidents on a daily basis. We literally have a team dedicated to Right Care, Right Person because we are concerned um, that we don't get the right response to the, that person at that point in time. Um, we have, day, we were having daily calls with system partners when Right Care, Right Person was implemented to ensure that the right agency was responding. Um, it still requires a lot of scrutiny um, and assurance to make sure nobody is slipping through the net. Um, and that's jointly with NIAS as well as the police. Yes, thank you. Obviously we're six months into it, so um, we'll see how it develops, I suppose. Are there any other questions okay well we've been uh, we are tasked with um at this point to are we submitting a formal response to this as well you've picked up what we've said as a committee chloe thank you for the presentation um i'm sure you will be seeing more of you and what have we um and uh with that i'll move on to the next item on the agenda thank you um and we're now into the report of the scrutiny officer uh, Chris, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, the forward plan in the agenda pack is just to note, I don't think there's anything on there that um, would come to this committee. Obviously, Cabinet met this morning, um, so some of the items on there have already been determined this morning, but again, I don't think there's anything for this committee. Um, and the work programme that accompanies it is also just to note, um, obviously, with the, having a new chair, I'll be meeting with um, Councillor Folks, Nesbitt, um, Jill and Neil later on just to, to finalise some of the, the work programme um, and I'll share that with members but if there's anything members want to add to the work programme um, mention it to, to the chair because I won't be here. Yeah, Georgina, I was going to suggest that I'll take emails on that. I am only six days into the job and in those six days we've, we've had elections and a bank holiday weekend so we're just coming back into the swing of things so please do feel free me. Yeah, yeah, all right. And if I may say so, I know you'll say something in, but I just think Chris has been a brilliant officer, so I really appreciate all you've done, and I know you'll say something at the end, Chair. Um, can I just ask, it's come up a lot, but the, the dentist situation in Berwick and elsewhere, I know we have struggled to get responses, so just wondering where we're at and when the next opportunity will be to question them and get that update. Um, the joint... ICS scrutiny that's run by Gateshead, of, of which we have members, have had um, some updates on the regional dental strategy, but I know it's more of a, 
I don't want to say local, because it's not, it's not local in that sense, but it is local from a regional point of view. It's a Northumberland-specific issue. Um, so we'll ask the ICB to come and talk about their dental strategy in Northumberland. It'll have been just over a year since we last had them here. So I think we've given them a bit of a chance to, to make some progress on some of the initiatives. Um, so I'll put that onto the work programme um, soon. Councillor Nisbet. Also, Chris, I'd like to bring back in... Um... The access to doctors because um, I'm getting more and more emails and phone calls regarding can't get an appointment. It's ridiculous. So it's not, even through the ICB, it's not working. Thank you. Okay. We move on to urgent business. I have no urgent business, but uh, Councillor Hill is a longer standing member of this committee than me has pointed out this is uh, Chris's last meeting, and I know I've dealt with Chris through the Health and Wellbeing Board and through the joint ICB at Gateshead, as you just mentioned, um, and you've been a, a great officer for us here, and we do wish you well. We will have new arrangements, they'll all be advised, um, so we, we, we go with our best wishes, and um, I'm sure everyone who's a long-serving member of this committee agrees that you've done a sterling job, so thank you very much for Sold that. Sort the Treasury out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Date of the next meeting, and that is Tuesday, the second of July. As per, we've got a some of us got a meeting coming up to talk about how forward plans. So, um, do bear with us if we're not out mingling as you normally do after a meeting, because we've got a meeting soon. So, thank you very much. Now, thank you. <laughs>